Thanks, Cole, for turning on the camera. Thanks, Noah. Um, others, please uh, turn on your camera so I can see you. Thanks, Ross. Um, okay, um, let's start. Today we have um, um, interesting topic to cover, um, continuation of macro architecture that we started um, earlier. Um, but today, uh, with more details, um, specifically how um, things can be implemented um, with the um, logic gates, um, the instruction that you already know, uh, their semantics, and how you can uh, you can implement them uh, at the macro architecture level. Before we jump in, uh, do you have any question? I noticed that uh, today um, I asked uh, TA if you remember uh, some of you uh, said that it's better um, TA probably have a session uh, going over the homework. Um, he tried to reach out to have a session over the weekend and also today um, not many of you attended. Um, so not sure what's going on, um, but I put the recording um, into our box so we can uh, you can uh, watch it later on. Um, but if um, if these sessions are not useful, probably um, you are not going to have them uh, unless you want to attend these sessions. Yes, Ross. I mean, I don't know if for everybody else, but at least for me, like I definitely would have gone if I didn't have class during the session. Um, and like the weekend, like. That was the same thing for the weekend one. Like I, I couldn't personally attend either of them, but that isn't to say that recordings wouldn't be like really helpful. If just, you know, going through as thoroughly, even if none of us are asking questions, you know, just having a recording because a lot of us, at least in personally, and I probably like a lot of other people who just can't attend it because personal obligations work, et cetera. So I, I, I would, I think some people probably feel the same that way. Just even having the recording would be really helpful. Oh, just a thorough explanation, even if we can't ask questions live. Right, yeah, that that, uh, that makes sense. Um, so uh, let me see, let me quickly change this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I see your point. Um, definitely uh, we do so uh, if you have um, like um, another sessions, um, Hopefully, we'll have uh, some of uh, some more sessions. These uh, additional sessions, um, but essentially, the point also part is uh, asking questions. Right, asking questions could change the discussion. Right, so I could ask him to uh, walk through the homework uh, by himself, record himself. But you know. Uh, these sessions are much more useful uh, if you ask question and uh, we are able to answer those um, in a way that help you to understand or like get an explanation in different ways, right? Uh, would otherwise, I mean, this is easier, uh, I would say, but it would be more fun and more useful for you guys uh, if you attend, not all of you, I don't expect all of you attend, obviously, um, but some of you, uh, somehow those who are curious to ask questions and um, could be helpful. Um, this is this is my opinion, uh, yeah. but I, I totally see your point. Yeah. And I, I was just going to say also, like, if you like, because I just saw that time was like, I know you said over the weekend and like people are agreeing with that, but the Tuesday time I felt was maybe just a little bit arbitrarily decided. And if you had like a poll or something, that could be tremendously helpful if, if, if a certain body of people voted for a certain, you give us several time slots and then we vote on yeah, um, something like that would be awesome, I, I think. Yeah, I think I, I forgot to mention it to, uh, to Nora's to do so. Um, it, it just uh, probably was my fault. I said, see what time works for, for uh, himself uh, well and then announce it uh, to you via Piazza. Uh, but probably I should have asked him to to uh, to send out a poll. Sorry about that. Uh, 
yeah i think that was a kind of mistake um so next time we'll do so Great, thank you i appreciate i appreciate uh, you listening to all, all that stuff i was just trying to give you give you some maybe just some some ideas about what the students were thinking i mean yeah, it's just yeah. me but you know yeah yeah absolutely and thanks thanks for that and uh, i wanted to also mention this um again i've mentioned that previously but again to emphasize um if you have any feedback if you want us to do anything that could help you to learn better or like anything like you can you can share and ask uh i'm not as scary you can definitely ask i will try my best uh to help you uh in the worst case i say no right uh but doesn't have any harm and definitely i try my best to to accommodate these needs um that, that somehow help you to um to learn better um i mean teaching is is somehow um it's not a straight forward um and um there always needs to be some adjustment uh, in order to make it more understandable especially these um somehow difficult advanced topics um but anyway thanks um so let's uh jump into uh some uh details um uh, we ended up uh last time uh about um uh, basically this um uh, architecture estate transformation from uh as to as prime um that um these estates are programmer visible estate and uh next like next estate logic is determined by instruction execution and specification right uh and you know that like uh the uh the semantic of each instruction tells you what would be the next architecture estate right so uh pay special attention to what right uh macro architecture uh implements how this architecture transformation will be done okay so is the difference between what what would be the next uh, architecture estate a macro architecture um, does this implementation um and we discuss about these uh, two choices where um this transformation happens in uh one single clock cycle um this is what we uh will cover mostly today uh and later on we'll cover this uh more realistic uh multi cycle uh transformation from as to as prime which this transformation involves some uh um uh, multiple uh transformations uh but these these intermediate states are not visible to the programmer um the programmer only see these um from as to as prime but this make it a difference when it comes to performance analysis and gaining some performance uh, boost um, at the implementation level okay uh and the uh the stuff that we uh, will cover today um uh, it's somehow easy uh but please uh pay special attention uh to some details uh the way I'm explaining it and if uh, some part is not clear please ask uh i can repeat it uh, or explain it other way uh sometimes i feel like okay this is straightforward i should not explain more uh but totally is um from your view uh might not be uh that is straightforward so please ask and then i can explain it in other way uh but it is very important so i want you to fully understand the material that we've covered today um and we we'll, uh we discussed this essentially from uh as to as prime uh that um this uh, transformation happens uh in one clock cycle this is a single cycle uh machine uh that we will go over today which is uh, a very simple uh you're familiar somehow uh with the overall process of 
using uh, combinational logic uh, uh, with some uh, sequential logic uh, that make this happen. Essentially, this combinational logic uh, uh, make this transformation happen. Uh, so um, we discuss about uh, what it means uh, by a state. Uh, hopefully, uh, you have a very clear idea um, about this. It is important. Uh, these are um, memory register and program counter uh, are what it means, what we mean by uh, architecture state. Um, we discuss it uh, with uh, different examples. So hopefully you have an understanding, a good understanding of what, it, uh, what we mean by architecture state. Um, and different instructions, uh, if you remember, uh, we had some discussion about particular instruction, change part of these, um, part of these uh, three aspects of architecture instruction. Some of them uh, may alter memory, some of them register um, and uh, program counter always uh, will change. You know that. Um, but they change differently, uh, mostly uh, in MIPS. Uh, it will increment it by four, uh, but you already know that some special instruction such as jump um, change the program counter differently uh, than the others. Um, but before we go into the detail, uh, we somehow discussed this uh, previously, but uh, let me explain it better um, for you to understand um, the difference between single and multi-cycle and why um, multi-cycle machines uh, are um, essentially uh, the default and like um, all modern machines are multi-cycle, um, um, single cycle machines. We, uh, it's important to understand how or, um, you design them um, because um, the um, most of the uh, macro architecture design between these two are similar and it's a lot easier uh, to explain single cycle. Um, so we start by single cycle, but you should know that um, almost all machines nowadays are multi-cycle and this is due to the um, uh, big advantage uh, that uh, multi-cycle machines have, uh, which is um, having a, um, a design uh, that enable better performance. Um, so in single cycle machine, uh, we discussed that no matter what instruction you want to execute, should uh, get executed in one cycle. Uh, and we discussed the difference between uh, um, the time that it may take to, um, to implement, to execute, uh, very simple instruction such as uh, no op, basically do nothing, only program counter would increment it. And like a, a mathematical operation such as division, uh, which uh, requires some uh, more um, logic gates to, uh, to get executed uh, in ALU. Um, and obviously has, um, in terms of performance required, it takes more time. Um, and this would uh, impact uh, the uh, cycle time, um, which, um, which has influence into the performance of uh, single cycle machines. But on the other hand, multi-cycle machines, uh, we are not, bounded by, um, by such constraint. Uh, we can split uh, into different stages 
uh, execution uh, into different stages and um, essentially uh, the slowest uh, stage become a bottleneck as opposed to a slowest instruction. Um, and to clarify the difference between these two again, uh, the slowest uh, instruction, um, you can uh, improve to some extent um, in terms of execution, even the slowest uh, instruction, like you can come up with a nice algorithm to implement division or some other slow uh, mathematical operations. Yeah, these uh, advances are possible. Uh, but again, uh, there are some uh, constraints uh, that you cannot improve over, you know, you cannot make division uh, to perform by half the time, right? Uh, you can like have some performance improvement, but not in a crazy way. But in multi-cycle, um, the, um, the design of the stages is uh, on our hands, right? So we are not bounded by uh, some constraints uh, that we cannot improve over a certain amount of, uh, amount of time, right? So it's more flexible and um, somehow uh, it, it um, provide this advantage of over single cycle that, um, um, that make uh, this type of machine a lot faster. And you will see that when it comes to um, different uh, topics in multi-cycle, such as pipelining, um, you will see why, uh, what do we mean by a stage and how uh, this difference uh, make a uh, big difference uh, in terms of performance. Do you have any question about this? Well, essentially, single cycle, multi cycle, um, uh, one human, different uh, way of uh, implementing one human model. Um, so from the uh, programmer uh, perspective, there is no violation of von Neumann um, model as we discussed. And again, um, two important properties of von Neumann mo uh, model, right? Instruction um, uh, at the time, a stored program, these two uh, important properties. So you should know that. Um, you know about this cycle, right? Uh, fetch, decoding, evaluate, address, uh, fetch, operand, execution, and a store result. Um, these are um, the um, instruction processing cycle um, or steps um, that we have previously discussed. Um, and, um, and basically, um, when it comes to um, designing uh, macro architecture, these, um, these steps are fundamental. Um, so we'll go over uh, each single of these steps uh, when we review each uh, design uh, blocks and when we design a, a specific, uh, when we design a macro architecture for a specific instruction. Um, and throughout uh, this lecture, one, one thing you should uh, know is that we start uh, by one type of uh, instructions. We start by the most fundamental building blocks. Um, and as we go uh, into, as we add more instruction, as we discuss uh, more instruction, this macro architecture become more complex. You will see that. So, um, just wanted to uh, give you this heads up that we start simple and we make this uh, design more complex as we go. Um, uh, 
Um, again, these six phases of the instruction processing cycle um, in single cycle machine uh, take a single uh, clock cycle to complete. Okay, so in single cycle machine, all these six um, steps uh, for all um, instructions should complete in one cycle. Okay, this is important. Multi cycle, um, we are not bounded by this. Um, could happen in multiple uh, clock cycle, even uh, each a step uh, like fetching could happen in multiple uh, clock cycle. Um, and maybe you already um, you already know why uh, that might be needed. Um, but maybe uh, could anyone you remind us uh, why like um, it might be the case that we may need different um, this flexibility. Why? In terms of design, why it is good um, to have this flexibility of uh, executing, like um, having different uh, stages, number of uh, stages, uh, and giving this flexibility of execution to these uh, steps. Do you have any idea or can you guess? Why, uh, why that, that might be in intuitive? Uh, even you don't need to think hard, but why um, that could be a good uh, design choice uh, when it comes to, um, when it comes to these different uh, steps uh, of a cycle. Any idea? No, um, it's easy. Um, so um, to remind you, um, it's just, you need to recall the semantic of each, each step, right? Um, if you remember some of these steps required the machine to uh, get access to the memory, okay? Um, and having access to the memory, you know that it is a, an expensive task uh, comparing to uh, the other data passes, um, other um, steps that um, do not require the machine to go into the memory and retrieve something from memory. Uh, so obviously there is, um, you remember we discussed when we, uh, you recall when we discussed these steps, we went through this complex machine, explain some data passes uh, that needs to uh, get executed uh, for each step. Um, and some of those, you remember it requires to, um, to go to the memory uh, and load uh, the content of a memory, put it into a special register in order to do some calculation later on. Um, so, um, so this flexibility, having this flexibility from the design perspective, make a total sense and it is important um, to have this. Uh, but single cycle machine, uh, all phases, of the instruction processing should um, should happen in one cycle. Um, in multi cycle, we are not bounded by that. Um, very important thing that you uh, you need to remember um, from now on. Um, An instruction processing engine consists of two important components, very important components, um, data pass 
and these are not very complicated um, and um, control uh, logic. So data pass uh, is the hardware elements uh, that deal with um, basically uh, there are some logic gates, hardware elements that deal with this um, transformation of the state, right? So, um, and you will see uh, some of these examples at like functional units that operate on data. Um, some muxes and wires that enable the flow of data into the functional unit and registers. You remember barely when we uh, discuss about um, these six steps um, in LC3D machine. Uh, we have some of these examples um, and also some storage unit that store the data like uh, registers. Um, so this everything that deals with uh, some operation movement of data around uh, and storing the data um, is uh, associated to the data pass. Um, so again, data pass consists of hardware elements that deal with uh, and transform data signals. Um, control logic, uh, you remember for each of these elements, we had some uh, input uh, annotated differently um that you need to set explicitly in order to uh, tell this unit uh what to do right so for example we have alu um alu could execute different uh operations the way how you communicate what operation you want to execute is through this control signal okay um and Macro architecture is nothing just having these hardware elements uh, putting together and making this coordination between uh, um, and coordinating this data pass uh, with appropriate control logic to make um, and to execute instruction uh, appropriately. Is there any questions? Okay. Um, yeah, the recording I mentioned that uh, it's uh, it's on uh, Dropbox. Uh, the recording of um, the session earlier today. Okay, um, so data pass, control logic. Um, make sure you understand this. Um, we already discussed about this. Um, yep. Um, one important thing you need to uh, know uh, is that, um, again, um, which makes things uh, somehow from design perspective um, complicated, not complicated, very restricted um, and weird. Uh, in single cycle machine control signals are generated in the same clock cycle um, as the one during which data signal are operated on. And we know that like this control signal um, um, and data signals could could um, could get executed at the same time. Could be uh, um, in a way uh, get executed at the same time if we design uh, if we design them appropriately by a single cycle machine. Like we have no choice rather than. Uh, generating in the same clock cycle, uh, which adds uh, time to, to this uh, clock cycle anyway. Uh, but in a uh, multi-cycle machine, um, this can be overlapped. Uh, and that's why 
we get more parties then. Um, um, and that's why multi-cycle machines are faster. And yeah, um, we'll discuss this um, later on, this um, like pipelining, um, especially pipeline data passes are important topics uh, when it comes to implementing uh, multi-cycle machines, um, but we'll not do it today. Um, And there are obviously different way of uh, generating the contour signals. Uh, I don't want to confuse you, um, but um, some control signals can be generated. One way of doing that is to generating this contour, contour signal by combinational logic, uh, or um, the other way is to, um, to somehow store this contour signal in memory uh, and um, communicate these contour signals, read these contour signals from memory as opposed to generating them by combination logic. Um, so there are multiple way of uh, uh, doing this, um, which uh, give rise to macro programming, um, but it's, uh, I don't want to confuse you at this point. Here, we mostly discuss through combination logic, especially today, or later on, we'll touch base on some of these, uh, especially uh, the way how this, the same thing can happen. Uh, this control signal can be generated by micro code, essentially, uh, not uh, necessarily a, um, hardware, um, could, you could you could write program to um, to um, in addition to to, to the um, memory uh, components to enable this um, control uh, signal to generate these control signals. Okay. Um, any questions so far? So quick thing, um, quick recap about performance. Um, I already discussed this performance previously, but uh, again, to remind you uh, why um, multi-cycle is better um, um, is um, we have uh, a certain way of uh, calculating uh, the execution time of a program. We know that uh, we have certain number of instruction uh, in each program. Um, so um, the execution um, time of an instruction, uh, if you have a clock cycle time, um, so um, the execution time of a program is, um, is nothing but just uh, counting the number of instruction multiplying by the average um, CPI, uh, multiplying by clock cycle time. Um, this uh, defines, this is a, uh, uh, this is an important equation essentially uh, to, to compute the execution time or um, latency of uh, a program get executed of on the machine that you are designing, right? Um, and, um, and in single uh, cycle macro architecture, um, essentially CPI uh, is one because you have only one cycle um, to, um, to execute the thing. Um, and as a result, uh, the clock uh, cycle time would 
would be long. And we discussed already why, right? So um, we, no matter what instruction, uh, even the uh, no op instruction in single cycle machine uh, is bounded by the longest instruction, right? So uh, if the longest instruction requires like 100 nanosecond, uh, then that is um, that is what it is, right? This is bounded. You you need to uh, pay this uh, cost for each single operations, each single instruction um, in when when you run your code, right? So even though the CPI in this case is one, the clock cycle time is. Um, is is long uh, and the number of instruction like between these two machines are the same but on multi-cycle macro architecture um, cpi could be different um, from instruction to instruction like for example um, cpi for um, like add could be like one number like two CPI for division could be 10, for example, right? Um, so um, add is simple to implement. It requires only two cycle. Um, division, it's more complicated. It requires 10 cycle. Uh, and by the way, CPI is cycle per instruction. Um, I didn't mention that. So, um, and, and as a result, uh, when, uh, when, you, when you have a program and to make a sense out of it, you can, uh, you can consider a very simple uh, scenario where you have a program that has um, um, 10 instructions. Out of these 10 instructions, you have nine add one division, okay? An imaginary uh, program, okay? Mm -hmm. So one add, uh, nine add one division. Mm -hmm. Add two cycle time, division 100 cycle time, right? 100 CPI, okay? Um, and then compare these two scenario. Uh, you can do it uh, very easily. Uh, so in um, in multi cycle uh, uh, architecture, um, so you have uh, nine uh, add which um, basically make the CPI what um, do you have an idea how, how how we can calculate this for for this imaginary program so imagine um as a result of this, um, this design, imagine that we design a multi-cycle uh, architecture, micro-architecture that uh, we could design it in a way to shorten the clock cycle time to 10 nanoseconds, right? Um, and number of, so this, the last term, clock cycle time, this could be a, uh, very simple exam question, right? Make sure you understand this. Um, so clock cycle time, in this case is two nanosecond, okay? Uh, number of instruction for this program is 10, right? Okay, so what would be the average CPI? It's very simple. Um, let me help you. Um,
Okay, so um, you are given a very simple program, uh, like 10 instruction, okay? Number of instruction, 10. Uh, you have nine add one division, okay? The add instruction, um, two cycle time, division, 100 cycle. And cycle time, is 10 nanosecond, okay? So um, you should already guess um, what would be the, um, now, um, so you, out of this, um, so you have a formula, it's very simple you have a um, number for two um, terms, you only need to calculate the average CPI. Um, CPI is a uh, cycle per instruction. So you have nine instruction that takes two plus one instruction that takes 100, okay? How many you have? 10, right? So very simple. Um, so it would be 18 plus 100 divided by 10, it would be 10 plus 1.8 would be 11.8, okay? So this is your average CPI. And there you go. You can um, calculate the uh, execution time would be ten multiplied by eleven point eight multiplied by ten nanosecond, and then you have the execution time. Okay. So this is for multi cycle. Let's calculate the um, the execution time when uh, when we have single cycle machine uh, in this scenario. In single cycle machine, um, like uh, average CPI is what CPI is um, is one for all instructions, right? So. Um, the average CPI um, as a result is one, uh, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, clock cycle time um, is typically large, right? Um, and to be fair, to have a fair comparison, right? Let's imagine that this, um, this imaginary uh, machine has these only two add and division uh, operations. Uh, by design, we know that this is uh, bounded by the slowest uh, operation, which is division in this case, right? So if you compare it with the previous uh, scenario, multi-cycle, uh, division takes 100, um, 100 cycle. So meaning that 100, uh, to 10 nanosecond would take to execute the vision, right? For add, it takes two cycle, right? So two to 10 nanosecond. So this is the amount of time required to execute add 
amount of time to require, require to, um, to execute the vision. And your design, your cycle time should be the longest, right? So it is this one, uh, division, which is 100 to 10 nanosecond, uh, is one millisecond, right? Um, so in this case, um, your cycle time is one millisecond or thousand nanosecond, right? Um, and the execution time would be how many instructions you have? 10. Your average CPI is one, right? Your um, um, cycle time is 1000 nanosecond. So in total, you have 10 over four nanosecond for executing this program. Um, here you've got how much? Roughly 10 over three nanosecond. So this is a single cycle machine is 10 times slower, right? So the question could be calculating how much, um, how slow is your single machine is comparing with this multi-cycle for this particular program, right? Um, very simple calculations. Do you have any question about this? Is uh, the whole calculation makes any sense? Are you clear about it? Because it is important to understand. And uh, again, this is relevant to this performance uh, trade-off that we discussed and I emphasized it many times. Um, so hopefully you understand this. Uh, how did you get the thousand nanosecond? <clears throat> Good question. Um, very simple um, calculation to make this fair. Uh, here, uh, you remember we mentioned that we need 100 cycle to execute division, uh, only two cycle to execute app, right? Um, and we assume that this cycle in multi-cycle is 10 nanosecond, okay? So you multiply these, uh, you get 1,000 nanosecond for executing division, right? Because we want to design these two to be fair, right? Um, app takes the same amount of time, no matter what, uh, the same for division. Um, like assuming that in these two machines, um, you, in, you use the same uh, logic gates for implementing app, right? So you should have a relative performance. But the things that, and you already should uh, see this, the thing that make a difference in terms of execution time of a program is your macro architecture that is not about one instruction, is about executing the whole program, right? Uh, having like, you design a machine that execute a program, uh, right? Um, and the whole machinery um, that we discuss in this course is about like being able to execute a program, right? Uh, multiple instructions. And you see that assuming that like the add or division takes the same amount of time, you see that this single uh, uh, cycle machine like is 10 times slower than the uh, multi-cycle machine. And like this is only like for simple program 10, uh, 10 instruction. And like you for general purpose uh, programs, um, thousand uh, millions uh, possible instructions. Um, this could give, get uh, even uh, the relative performance could become wider. Um, and if you think clearly, um, one thing I ask you to, to understand very well, 
um, because it helps you to appreciate um, this multi-cycle machine uh, or design or appreciate different better design um, is that um, for generic programs, um, you typically um, do not have uh, many complex instruction. You have many instruction typically. Few of them are complex, takes more time. Mostly they are very simple. Relatively takes uh, um, takes a short amount of time comparing with the um, complex instruction, right? So like you have large programs. Most of these instructions are so simple, few are um, complex. In single cycle machine, it's crazy because these like, you have a program like each instruction takes the same amount of time and this same amount of time is like determined by this, uh, the, uh, the crazy instruction, the complex instruction. But in multi-cycle machine, you have the flexibility to like vary that. Like if, um, um, if like this um, instruction is complex, sure, yeah, give it a more cycle. Uh, that's fine uh, to execute. If it's simpler, yeah, um, give it a smaller number of cycles to execute. And overall, the average uh, CPI would be a small as a result, right? Because you have so many simple instruction with a small uh, cycle time, um, cycle per instruction. And you have only few instruction that like you require like 100 cycles to get executed, right? And like this will uh, result in a program that has a small CPI, average CPI, um, and obviously a small uh, cycle time. So you get much better performance as a result. Does it make any sense? Very good. Um, Yeah, if you have any other um, question about this, let me know. I can explain it. Okay, um, this is about performance. Um, again, this stuff is useful for exam courses, right? So uh, simple, but uh, interesting question could be asked. So let's uh, go and design some single cycle micro architecture. Um, how much time we have? We have. Sorry. Okay. And um, again, um, these um, architecture transformation um, needs to happen in one cycle, and we are going to do that with combinational logic um, in single cycle machine. And um, uh, let's start with some simple state elements. Um, again, these are state elements um, uh, that you are familiar with. We have PC, one very important uh, state element. You have registers, right? Um, which are also um, very important, as you know. Um, a good number of instruction in your machine requires uh, registers for either calculating um, something or like retrieving something. Um, and you have some memory um, units uh, where you um, you store data um, and um, and obviously uh, 
programs as well, right? So this is the memory that you also, uh, in addition to the data, you, you also store the uh, programs. Um, and, and also you have is, uh, a, a control unit um, that, um, that basically um, retrieve the instructions um, and um, giving the uh, instruction address, um, it, it gives you, um, or is basically um, the, um, the part of the memory like here, like it's separated into like, even though like you mentioned that like, this is a unified memory where we have both uh, instruction and data the same place. But for some design decision, like let's assume that we, we have a, two separate units. Um, one uh, is uh, you store the instruction, uh, one you store the data. Um, and you will see the reason, but think about it as two sub units of the same memory, right? Um, Again, uh, it is important to um, to get some yeah, with the notation uh, as we go. Um, we discussed that previously um, about these notations, um, but um, for example, here you remember for. Mix, we had uh, how many? 32 um, uh, registers, um, right? Um, and, um, and we had a register file. So um, these um, red lines uh, are the control signals that you need to communicate with these uh, units. Uh, for example, this uh, red right, uh, meaning that if you set it uh, to zero, um, you expect that there's nothing should be written in the register file. If you set it to one, meaning that you enable writing to the register file. Um, so this um, control signals uh, are required in order to communicate uh, what exactly you want to do with these units, right? Um, the same way for, for example, for memory, you have memory write, memory read, so you can set them appropriately uh, in order to uh, communicate the right signal to these units uh, in order to do your task. Any question about it? Hopefully these are simple, right? Um, but if it is not, I assume you already know that, how to interpret it. Uh, we discussed that previously, if not, I'm happy to, to clarify. And like a few, uh, Clarification uh, here, um, but don't get confused about this. Um, these things will become a lot clearer later on. Um, but um, here we assume a somehow a magic memory and register file, which um, the output of the read data port is a combination of function of the register file content and the corresponding uh, read select port meaning that you um, are the same because like single cycle machine, um, you have one cycle to execute things. So um, you, you should generate the, um, uh, the control signal uh, and you should have the data ready uh, to, to do things, to execute the instruction in the same clock cycle. Um, 
So um, the selected register is basically updated on the positive edge clock at transition when write is enabled. Um, and, and there is no reading can, can be going on between clock edges. Um, so these um, positive clock edges uh, of, uh, of the, um, um, of your clock uh, essentially is the coordination uh, or is a way to generate these control signals. Um, we discussed briefly about these previously with some examples. You had much uh, higher exposure uh, for sure in uh, like uh, um, in digital logic design course. Um, so, um, but if you have any question, if you need any clarification, please do let me know. Um, but again, uh, if some of these are not clear, uh, don't worry about that. Um, things will get clearer as you see more examples. Uh, as you see more design, um, these things become a lot clearer uh, beyond the definition becomes more intuitive for you uh, later on when you see some, some examples, um, especially when it comes to designing particular uh, simple machine to execute a um, single instruction, for example. Um, Um, this is a um, very simple uh, data pass um, that shows um, these different um, steps uh, that you are familiar with. Um, instruction fetching, uh, when uh, you fetch a instruction from memory, um, and then once you fetch the instruction, you need to um, decode it, right? So uh, you need to decode it, uh, what it is, this instruction. Um, and um, you also need to uh, fetch the operand. Um, so here, what you, um, this decoding basically uh, um, enable you to send the right signal uh, to ALU. For example, if this is an add or like multiplication instruction, then you send the right signal here. And also you, um, you know that how, uh, what, is, what registers you need to, um, you need to um, get access to from the register file. Um, in, in the next stage uh, is, uh, is about, um, executing um, or evaluating the memory address. So obviously you need to, um, and you know that for some instructions, um, it doesn't matter, like you don't need to do that. Uh, the um, memory um, is not relevant, but in some instruction you need to uh, read from memory. Um, so you have this step uh, where, um, you need to um, evaluate a memory address um, and have the uh, access to the data and retrieve it um, to, um, to do something with it. For example, you have load work, right? So um, load work as an instruction, uh, you, um, you somehow calculate the, uh, address, uh, once you um, calculate the address in this step, uh, you need to uh, fetch uh, the content of the memory, and then you need to uh, store the result into some register, right? So uh, you load the word and put it into a register um, as a result. And this is the data pass. So once you uh, read it from, uh, from the previous, the mem step, 
you put it into the bus uh, where it um, it sends the um, the content of the memory into um, into a register, right? So uh, put it into a particular register, uh, which is determined by uh, uh, the encoding of the instruction, right? Um, what register again? Like this, this happens during the um, the decoding stage. And um, these are the generic steps uh, that uh, you already know about it, right? So again, to repeat, um, um, fetching the instruction. Um, so fetching meaning that like you have an address uh, from PC. Um, you ask, hey, PC, what instruction I'm going to execute now? You fetch the instruction, uh, you interpret and decode the instruction, like what instruction it is, like it is the R type, I type, what it is. Um, then you may need to like um, um, send the right signal um, to the register file that I'm going to put something into this particular register, right? Uh, and um, um, sending the right signal uh, to ALU that I'm going to give you an address, go and ask the, put the mem put this address or sign extend it. Um, so you need to ask ALU, hey, like I need this favor, sign extend this for me um, and then put it in here, right? Um, you put the address um, or sometimes um, um, you want to write to the memory, right? So um, again, um, during the uh, interpretation, the coding, you realize that you need to uh, put the content of a register here so you can send it to, from this part, you can send it to memory and write it into the memory. Um, so during the uh, execution uh, or evaluating memory address, this will happen. And then um, either you write to the memory and if this is um, reading like loading word or whatever, you need to read something from the memory. You put the uh, content um, or result that um, you get from the memory into the bus and um, communicate it to the register file. Do you have any question about this? This is like very generic uh, explanation of these uh, uh, steps uh, that you are familiar with. But um, when it comes to the design, like this is the uh, full MIPS data pass, right? So this is the somehow um, abstract view or like the real implementation of the MIPS data pass um, that we are going to understand and make a sense out of it. Again, like um, you can find these details into your book in, in your book as well, but um, and don't um, get um, confused by the complexity that you see here. Things become a lot clearer for you that you can design such macro architecture yourself um, or in the least interpret this uh, what's going on um, by the end of um, not today, but by the end of next um, lecture, um, you will have a lot better understanding of uh, how to interpret things. Um, probably we should stop here. Um, 
given that we are out of time. Um, and then um, on Thursday, uh, the plan is to discuss, um, to start very simple, um, specifically, uh, we start by one type of instruction, right? By R type instruction, um, like add, for example, uh, you already know this encoding, machine encoding, you already know the semantic of this instruction. Um, then we start by putting together the um, logic gates um, that we can, uh, we can uh, make this, transform this semantic of the instruction into some combinational state object logic, right? So um, by putting together these um, elements, these uh, logic gates, we, uh, we basically uh, make this semantic executable by um, transforming it to combinational state uh, object logic. Uh, and you can, uh, you can clearly see that how things get executed uh, at the uh, macro architecture level using this uh, architecture element. Um, we start very simple. Um, and then uh, once we add more instruction, like we start by R type, then we add I type, um, the machine gets uh, more complicated, right? So we need to uh, clearly add more elements um, and make the machine more complicated in order to, um, to, um, to be able to execute this new instruction. So we add more instruction, the design gets more complicated. Um, and at the end, once we cover almost all instruction, then, uh, then basically uh, you can understand the whole, the whole design. You can, you can understand the whole um, design as you see here um, and make a sense out of it. Um, let alone, you, you should be able to also uh, maybe come up with your own design uh, or have some idea how to change this to get a better performance. Uh, right, if you want to. Uh, but the least thing is to interpret this design um, and make a sense out of it. Uh, it is very important. Uh, you are going to have questions about this in your exams. Uh, so make sure you understand this fully. And it is one of the most fundamental topics in computer architecture. Um, so make sure that you uh, you understand, and if you have any question, ask it throughout the next lecture. So, yeah, um, thanks. And I will stay here for a few minutes. If you have any question, please do ask. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Eric, um, will a test problem involve knowing semantic or naming these components? Um, typically in test, um, naming is not important, but interpreting uh, or designing things uh, is important, right? So you will, um, you will get questions like, for example, you are, you are given some elements uh, without a data path, then how, how, to, how you can connect things with the right elements to, um, to have the right data path as well as uh, ability to generate the right control signals. This is the kind of question that uh, you will get asked. Um, 
connecting things together uh, for the macro architecture part of the course. Um, these are typical questions you um, you will see uh, in uh, in exam. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you guys. Have a good evening.